All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, let's see, uh, Vito, you want to pray for us? And uh, Travis? Jesus, yeah. I pray that our hearts will look to you right now. Yeah. We ask ourselves, Lord, and Holy Spirit, we prepare our hearts. Like, why are we here? Lord, we need to hear you. I need to hear you tonight. Ah, Lord Jesus, you are all that matters. Pray we can uh, have ears to listen to you tonight, Jesus. That we receive the word you have for us. That we'd be changed. That we'd have a, a faithful expectation that like, you want to do supernatural work in our hearts. And all the burdens, the struggles, the, the flesh, the things in us that uh, just seem like it's too much. That we would trust that um, you are in control incapable and willing to push all that aside. Lord, we need your word tonight. Uh, Jesus, I pray that uh, on our hearts it would be, we take the time serious. And we would see you clearly tonight, Jesus. Who you are. And Holy Spirit, you would uh, show us and lead us to respond to that. And I would say yes to cling to you, Jesus. You change the desires of our heart more and more. And I set us in motion right now, Lord, that our hearts would thirst and cling to every word you have for us tonight. Push us to that place, Jesus. Let's shed everything in this moment uh, and prepare ourselves. I love you, King. I have your way with us tonight. I would expect you to do uh, the supernatural. Oh, yes, Lord Jesus. I just want to thank you, Lord. I want to thank you for this time that you allow us to gather, Lord. I want to thank you for the meal in which you prepared, Lord Jesus, to give us strength to be able to wholeheartedly uh, hear your word, Lord Jesus. Um, I pray that our ears are attentive and our, our, our hearts are open to the message in which you're about to speak, Lord Jesus. I pray that it deeply saturates our hearts, Lord, and I pray that it transforms us, that it moves us to motion. Moves us to action to be able to be obedient to your word and walk it out, Lord Jesus, as we hear your word. I pray that it sinks deep into our souls, Lord Jesus. Uh, I thank you again for uh, giving us the opportunity to be able to sit here tonight, Lord, and hear your word and take communion, Lord, and just enjoy you and feast on you, Lord Jesus. Uh, you are good to us. I never want to fail to not give you glory for who you are and what you do and what you can do and what you're going to do, Lord Jesus. Uh, so may all praise and glory be to you. It's in your name I pray. Alright, so the word of God in First Peter says this. So prepare your mind for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then, but now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy.
pass these uh, communion cups out. <coughs> All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna read out of uh, uh, Matthew 27. Uh, you know, I went home uh, earlier today and was just uh, just sitting by myself and flipping through the Bible and just uh, um, asking Jesus what to point out to me, man, what He uh, um, wanted me to say, and uh, it was uh, I pretty much just felt like <clears throat> I don't need like a bunch of um, stuff that I written up myself or or all these words that were big words or to uh, I don't know just to make it like look good and um, I, I was just Jesus was like just just speak the word of God like just there's nothing wrong with just speaking the word of God it's it's all it's all faithful and it's true um, so I'm going to start in uh, Matthew 27, um, 26, and I'm going to read a little bit of this uh, crucifixion and death of Jesus. <clears throat> uh, so Pilate released uh, Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus uh, flogged with a lead tip whip, then turned over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. Some of the governor's soldiers took Jesus into their headquarters and called out, uh, the entire regiment they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him they wove thorn branches into a crown and put it on his head and they placed <clears throat> a reed stick in his right hand as a scepter then they knelt before him in mockery and taunted hail king of the jews and they spit on him uh, and grabbed the stick and struck him on the head with it uh, when they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off the robe and put on his own clothes, or put his own clothes on him again, uh, then led him away to be crucified. Uh, along the way, they came across a man named uh, Simon, who was from Serene, as the, and the soldiers forced him to carry uh, Jesus' cross. And they went out to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. The soldiers gave Jesus wine mixed with bitter gale, but when he had tasted it, he refused to drink it. After they nailed him to the cross, a soldier, uh, the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. Uh, then they sat around and kept guard as he hung there. <clears throat> a sign was fastened above Jesus, announcing the charges against him. It read, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Two revolutionaries were crucified with him, one on each his left and one on his right. The people passing by shouted abuse, shaking their heads in mockery. Look at you now, they yelled at him. He said you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well then, if you're the son of God, save yourself and come down from the cross. The leading priests, the teachers of religious law, and the elders also mocked Jesus. He saved others, they scoffed, but he can't save himself. So is he the king of Israel, is he? Let him come down from the cross right now, and we will believe in him. He trusted God, so let God rescue him now, if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. 
even the lever, even the revolutionaries who were crucified with him ridiculed him in the same way. <clears throat> At noon, darkness fell across the whole land until three until three o'clock. About three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, uh, "My God, My God, why have you abandoned me?" Some of the bystanders misunderstood and thought he was calling for the prophet Elijah. One of them ran up and filled a sponge with sour wine, holding it up on a reed stick so he could drink. But the rest said, wait, let's see whether Elijah comes to save him. Then Jesus shouted out again, and he released his spirit. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, rocks split apart, and tombs opened. The bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. They left the cemetery after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city of Jerusalem and appeared to many people. The Roman officer and the other soldiers at the crucifixion were terrified by the earthquake and all that had happened. They said, this man was truly the Son of God. So let's take communion together, family. Let's sing this together, guys, uh, when I look at the blood.
let's sing of the gospel, church.
Let me ask you a question before we get started. Since most of us were just singing that song, Echo Holy, that verse in there where it says, my heart can't help but sing. Like, honestly, as you sit here right now, would you say that that's true? That, that it wasn't really up to you, but that your heart couldn't help but sing. Because there's three kinds of people that are going to be sitting here tonight that are always everywhere, right? There's the people that their heart can't help but sing because they've experienced life. They've experienced what real life is. They've had a real encounter with Jesus. They have the Holy Spirit living in them. A miracle has taken place. And now they no longer are in control. But Jesus is in complete control. And the Holy Spirit controls them. And your heart can't help but sing. I remember talking with some of the pastors out in Manaway when me and Billy were going out there and we were having a meeting out there at one time. And uh, we were just talking about how funny it is that like we would, you know, like those guys would go do like open mic nights at like the local bars or coffee shops and stuff like that. And they were just talking about how, you know, they just have this realization sometimes is they're just sitting there strumming this guitar with all these non-believers there, right? And they're just singing about the blood of Jesus. And they would just have this realization like, man, that must just seem so crazy to a lot of people sitting here. And yet all of us have a story of a, a time in our lives where that would have seemed crazy to us, right? But then that miracle takes place that the Holy Spirit enters into you. And, and you're totally different. And your heart can't help but sing about how awesome Jesus is. And so, like, I just want to ask you that question. Now, now there's some other people that will be sitting here that, you know, you have experienced new life, but uh, the Holy Spirit living in you, it's been dulled for whatever reason. It's been, it's been dulled out. You've been stifling the Holy Spirit in your life, maybe by the way you're living, maybe, maybe because you're chasing after the things of this world or you're focused on the things of this world. And then there's that third person that just doesn't have the Holy Spirit living in them. And yet all three of those people, I believe, are gathered here tonight. And it's not by accident. It's not by mistake that Jesus has brought us here to this moment, here and now, to really experience him in a real way. That, like, if I asked you, how's your day? I've been having to correct everybody because one of the things Jesus has been pointing out to me lately is like, you know, we, if I said, how's your, how's your day? How was your day today? It wouldn't seem like a big deal. And, and most everybody would answer it, whether it's true or not, with the word good. Right. And it's just become a very cliche thing that we do, that we say to one another. And yet Jesus has constantly been reminding me lately just like, that I don't have a day. That, that if there's a day, it's because he made it. Like today is the day that the Lord has made. And so that means it's all about him and that it's all for him. And, and so let me ask you another question. Like, is that how you have experienced your day today? Because what happens is, is when we're not having that, the, I, I know people would be really quick to say, oh, but you know what we mean when we say that. But what if, what if us just, going through the motions and the routine and just having things that we say and not really being intentional on focusing on Jesus and everything. And instead of going, hey, how's your day today going, man? How's your time with Jesus been today? Like, how different do you think it would be, just everything, as you went throughout not your day but his day that he made that's all about him? Because what I've noticed is lately, like, all the opportunities that I've had to point people to him and to talk about him and, and to share what Jesus has done in my life and to share the gospel with people. And, and when, we don't, when we don't have that in front of us, in, in, in the forefront of our mind, that, man, this is Jesus' day. Like, no, seriously. This is Jesus' day that he's made. You just got to wonder, how many opportunities do you really miss out on on telling people about Jesus and pointing them to the only one who really matters? 
Because I just think sometimes as we sit here, like, you know, 100 years from now, 300 years from now, 500 years from now, I'll be able to look over and see some of you guys. Just think about that. In perfection, everything perfect. I think it starts, though, like, with us just having the realization that we really need to be intentional about stuff, and we can't just go through the motions when it comes to anything. And so even as we're gathered here tonight, it, it became really apparent to me during <laughs> worship what, like, what the prayer was for our time tonight, and it, and it happened while, while Big Losh was reading the crucifixion. And if you didn't catch it, in the crucifixion, you know, one of the things that always gets me is when they dress him up like a like a king and they're making fun of him. And then it says when they were tired of doing that. Like they became exhausted with making fun of Jesus and beating on him to a point that they were just like, well, this isn't fun anymore. Let's do something else to him. You know? But, but everybody was making fun of him. And when they hung him on the cross, everybody was making fun of him. And if you didn't catch it, in Matthew, both the criminals, one on the left and one on the right, were both making fun of him. Even as the people were passing by, and see, both these criminals hanging beside Jesus were making fun of him and were mocking him. But listen to what it says in Luke. In Luke chapter 23, listen to what it says in verse 39. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed, so you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested, don't you fear God even when you've been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you'll be with me in paradise. See, people like to point that out and think that there's some kind of loophole in the scriptures or there's some kind of contradiction instead of really recognizing what happened. See, as these two guys hung there, full of pride and self and making fun of Jesus, as they encountered Jesus on the cross, something happened to one of them. Something happened to one of them, and he was humbled by the way that Jesus was giving up his life, by the way that Jesus was dying on the cross, by the way he was loving the people that were killing him. And one of those criminals has the realization that he's guilty and that he deserves death for what he's done. And he realizes it's not for what he's done to people, but he realizes he's hanging next to God. And he deserves death because of the crime he's committed against God. And so my prayer while we were worshiping there that, that I started to pray for us is that we would be humbled like that. We would be reminded. Because that's not a place that you're just supposed to visit one time or you had an experience with Jesus. You're supposed to live from there. I'm supposed to live from there. We're supposed to live from that place. And so we were out in Toledo, uh, you know, to see uh, Athena's boyfriend for his birthday. And his uh, parents got us a place to stay out there. Like, if you would come and bring your daughter to surprise him for his birthday. So we were out there. And the, the place had a pretty decent gym. And, you know, I got the, the great idea to take my kids in there and train them because you were allowed to take them in there with the parents. So we were in there and we were, I was teaching them how, how to do different workouts and stuff and use different weights. And, uh, you know, Delilah was following instructions pretty good. But then Abel, you know, is trying to pick up this big, heavy weight. And he's running around. I look at Abel and I go, man, listen. I go, that's not how you do that. How you do that? I started to explain to him. And he said, yeah, 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 I know. He said, yeah, 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 I know. And, and I had to, like, get a hold of him and go, listen, buddy. Listen. Like, when you think you know everything and you think you got it all figured out, like, it's dangerous. And it's not just dangerous to you, but it's dangerous to those around you. He was hanging a, a very heavy dumbbell over Delilah's face, right? But there's a spiritual truth there. See, oftentimes we can get together in a place like this, here and now, and we come in with that attitude. 
Yeah, 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 I know. And, and you even just think that you're just here to be yeah, confirmed some things you already know. Hey, I'm already going to hear some stuff that I know, I'm sure. And God forbid we start to go, hey, turn to John 3, 16, right? Because everybody has that attitude when they hear that scripture. Yeah, 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 I know. And, and, and it's dangerous. If you're sitting here right now and your attitude when you walked in here and sat down was, yeah, 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 I know or you think you have it all figured out, it's dangerous. It's dangerous to you, and it's dangerous to those around you, and it's dangerous to anybody else that you'll encounter. And so I'm praying for that humility that that criminal has on the cross. And he had it because he was on the cross with Jesus. And it's a picture of picking up your cross. It's a picture of dying with Jesus. And that's something we're supposed to do constantly. Constantly. Jesus says daily. We're supposed to be in that kind of surrender and submission to him. And so it's dangerous if you come in here tonight and that's your attitude. Because I think what we've started to do in the church especially is confuse uh, spiritual maturity with spiritual arrogance. And we go, yeah, 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 I know. And now we think we're spiritually mature. Well, let me just tell you, spiritual, spiritual arrogance knows, but it doesn't show. It knows, but it doesn't show. There's a lot of people that know, know this. But it's not showing. It's not really showing in their life. In fact, spiritual maturity is marked by childlike faith. And I don't know about you guys, but the closer and the closer I get to Jesus, the more and more I realize I don't know. There's things I don't know. There's things that I thought I knew that I'm like, I just, I don't know anything, Jesus. And when, when Abel did that, it made me think of Matthew chapter 11, where Jesus is talking to, to the religious leaders and stuff who would have said, hey, yeah, yeah, I know. They, they thought they knew. And here they are standing in front of God telling them that they know and Jesus says, what can I compare this generation to? It's like children playing a game. And they say, hey, we sing these songs, these funeral songs, and you don't mourn. We sing these wedding songs, and you don't dance. And, and he's going, Jesus is going, you think you have everything so figured out. And what Jesus is pointing out, that they're spiritually arrogant. And they think they know. And they think they know best. And they think they know what it should look like. And all of that. And then Jesus starts to pray later on in that chapter. And he goes, thank you, Father, for hiding it. For hiding the truth from people who think they're so wise and clever. But revealing it to the child. Like, so Jesus gives a picture of these two kids. See, Abel wasn't always like that. The first thing out of Abel's mouth all the time wasn't, I know, I know, I know. He didn't always know it all. Right? There was a time I had to wipe his butt. Can you go to the bathroom, right? If you're a kid at one point in your life. You're sitting here at one point. You were a kid, and you needed somebody to do that. And so Jesus, when he's talking in Matthew chapter 11, one of those kids that he, he uses the word like children playing is like a kid who's old enough to be out running around. And then the other word when he says those with childlike faith is an infant. And so spiritual maturity is marked by a childlike faith, like true childlike faith, like an infant. Totally dependent on Jesus for everything. See, Abel used to be totally dependent on me and his mom for everything. And then at some point he gets to a certain age and he knows it all. And that happens to us. And I think we just need to be reminded of what kid we're supposed to be if we're going to be close to Jesus. If you're sitting here and you think, oh yeah, 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 I know, I know, and you got it all figured out, you're in trouble. Because you should measure spiritual maturity by your faith. That's what it says in Romans 12, 3. Don't evaluate yourself as better than what you really are. But measure yourself by your faith. By your life of faith. By the way that you really trust Jesus. By the way that you really depend on him. And if you really think about the book of Job. I know you guys know that I love that book. But that's because... Like that whole book, right? 40-some chapters 
It is about spiritual arrogance. That like every, every all this stuff happens to Job and him and all his friends and they're all gathered around and they're all just telling Job uh, why it's happening. And there's this little bit of truth of the gospel weaved through that whole book. But there's constant people going, this is why this is happening. You did something or you didn't do something. And Job is even defending himself at some point in that book. And he's saying, no, this is why. And this is who God is. And this is what he does. And really, what's really happening is in the first chapter, there's something happening behind the scenes in a world that you can't see. In the spiritual realm where Satan has literally walked into the throne room and said, Job doesn't love you. And Jesus is going, let me show you that my creation and the people who belong to me are all about me. And really what's going on in the whole book of Job is it's all about his glory. It's all about who Jesus is. It's all about him. And that's what's going on in the spiritual realm. And yet these people in Job, they have this, this physical perspective, this human perspective and they think they know what's going on, and they're very spiritually arrogant. And that's why when Jesus shows up, and he says, now I'm going to ask you some questions since you guys know so much. I'm going to ask you some questions, Job, and you have to answer me. But it ends with Job saying, I know that you can do anything and no one can stop you. And you asked, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? It is I. And I was talking about things I knew nothing about. Things far too wonderful for me. You said, listen, and I'll speak. I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. I had only heard about you before, but now I have seen you with my own eyes. I take back everything I said, and I sit in the dust and ashes to show my repentance. In fact, the, the literal translation here goes, I hate myself. He goes, I take back everything I said, and I detest myself as he encounters the one and only living God. But, but this is the point I want to make, because after that, this is what Jesus says. After the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to you know, his friends, I'm angry with you and your two friends, for you have not spoken accurately about me as my servant Job has. You know, it's not until this point when Job says, I know you can do anything and nothing can stop you. And he's like a little infant sitting there. And he goes, I know nothing like, I talked about things, and I said things that, I, like, were far too wonderful for me to even understand what was really going on. That Jesus goes, now you got it. Now you get it. That's what he says. He goes, Job has talked right about me now. It's not the whole book that Jesus is saying that about. Job was right the whole time. That's not, that's not what he's saying. It's right here. When Job finally goes, you can do anything you want. Nobody can stop you. And he's talking about even the things that happened to him. He's going, it wasn't my family. It wasn't my family that you took. That was yours to give or to take or to do whatever you want. That wasn't my stuff that you took. It all belonged to you, Jesus. You can do whatever you want because you know the way to bring yourself glory best. And as we sit down here on these little couches and stuff like He's on a throne, surrounded by hundreds of millions of angels, screaming how awesome he is. And so I hope that's what you were doing when you worshiped, when you sang. I hope that's, I hope that's who you were singing to. I hope you're really singing to him. Because one of the things that Jesus has just been pointing out to me lately, even about worship, is like, are we singing songs that sound good to us? Is that why we pick them? Is that why we like them? Or are we really concerned about what sounds good to him? I mean, is that really at the core of why we sing? You know? Because I know what that's like. Like, we've went to concerts and different things in the past and, and gravitated towards things that sound good to us. It's like, Jesus is like, we're so concerned about things that sound good. Like, we make even worship that's supposed to be about him, about us. And, and the key to, to all that is, really, is acceptance, right? Job comes to this place where he starts in the beginning really well. 
He starts really well in the beginning. He goes, should we only accept good things from God and nothing bad? And he worships. But then he gets lost there in the middle. And he starts talking about things and thinking that God is someone that he's not. And he becomes very spiritually arrogant until the end when he actually experienced what spiritual maturity really is. And so the key is he came to a place of, of acceptance. And, and so listen to what it says here in, in uh, 1 Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, in verse 15. Now listen, I believe, I, I, I wholeheartedly believe that the word here in 1 Timothy chapter 1 tonight has the power to bring you to a place of true worship. If you'll accept it, and that's what it starts by saying. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. Now listen to verse 17 because this is really the core of everything he's saying right here. All honor and glory to God forever and ever. He is the eternal king the unseen one who never dies. He alone is God. Amen. And you see where Paul is going, this is all about the honor of God's name. I mean, just think about what the Bible says about this. Just to, just to remind us all. Psalm 23, verse 3, he renews my strength. He guides me along right paths. This is after he takes like nice long walks on the beach with you. And leads you by peaceful streams. Why? Bringing honor to his name. Psalm 25, verse 11. For the honor of your name, O Lord, forgive my many, many sins. Psalm 79, verse 9. Help us, O God, of our salvation. Help us for the glory of your name. Save us and forgive us our sins for the honor of your name. So why did Jesus save you? For the honor of his name. For his glory. Why does Jesus forgive you? For the honor of his name. For his glory. Because of who he is. And, and you got to remember that because then you'll understand where it says this is a trustworthy saying and everyone should accept it. And so this is talking about true acceptance. Not the passive thing that we talk about when we talk about acceptance where it's like I'm going to accept Jesus into my heart the picture of that passive that passive acceptance would be Peter in the boat and Jesus going hey follow me and I'm going to teach you how to fish for people and Peter going no it's cool I'm just going to say a prayer stay in my boat <laughs> I accept you though into my heart you go ahead Jesus I'm going to pray from here I got some fishing to do and yet so often, that's exactly what we see. We see people claiming to follow Jesus and saying that they love Jesus, and yet their life displays them still in the boat, kind of doing what they want to do, and not laying it down completely and leaving everything and following Jesus. And so when it says, man, this is to embrace this saying, this teaching, because in that Matthew 11 where Jesus is talking about the kids, y'all probably would say, I know it. Be careful. Those who have heavy burdens, come to me. But what's he say? He goes, you look up to me and let me teach you. Let me teach you. So here in 1 Timothy, it says this is a trustworthy saying. Everyone should accept it that Jesus came into the world to save sinners. See, most people would say, yeah, 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 I, I know that. You would, you would point to John 3, 16. God so loved the world. This is how God loved the world. 
that he sent his only son, that he gave everything so that if you would believe in him, you wouldn't perish, but you would have eternal life. Well, let me ask you, when's the last time that that verse brought you to your knees? You know why? Because you haven't accepted. Well, when's the last time John 3, 16 really brought you to worship? And I get it. There's a dullness that can happen with being familiar with things. But look at what it's saying here. The reason that that verse doesn't bring you to worship. Right? Even if you think about, okay, so even if you think about what Jesus is saying to the Pharisees and stuff, when they come in Mark chapter 2 and they ask the disciples, why does Jesus eat with such scum? And so we know that, that John 3.16 and, and 3.17 just is amazing. He didn't come into the world to judge the world, but to save the world. That's because it's already been judged. It's already guilty. It's guilty. Why do you need saved? And so by the time you see Jesus there in Mark chapter 2, and they come around and go, man, why does, why does Jesus eat with such scum? And Jesus says, what? I came to save those who know that they're sick, not those who think that they're good. And so if you really know that, let me ask you, do you really, do you really believe that? How often do you think you're good? Do you really think you're good? I mean, it's like when Jesus says, hey, if you're, if you're last, you're first, and, and if you're first, you're last, and, and yet I don't see people fighting for last place. That's never a problem, right? I just wanted to be last, and I just couldn't. Somebody else beat me to it. We're no danger of that happening, right? And that's no different here. So why are you so worried about uh, if, if you still look like scum to the world? Why do we still care so much about what the world thinks? I mean, if, if Jesus ate with scum, if he was close to the what they called the scum of the earth, I'm like, then I want to be scum. That's what happens when you really encounter Jesus. You're going, well, if that's who's close to Jesus, then that's me. And so the reason that a verse like John 3.16 doesn't bring you to true worship is because you've only accepted part of that saying. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And you're going, okay, yeah, most of us would go, oh yeah, I know that. What about the next part? And I'm the worst of them all. See, the church has done a disservice with this because what they've only preached this as is just that it's about Paul. But that's not what it says. It says everyone should accept this. I mean, do you really think like you're the worst sinner of all? When's the last time you've really embraced that? Because that'll bring you to true worship. See, it doesn't sound like it would, right? It's like, you're like, whoa, hold on. No, but it will. That'll bring you to true worship. Every time I embrace that truth, I embrace the cross. And I experience the full embrace of Jesus at the cross. And so, I'm the worst. This isn't just about Paul. Of course, if you want to use him as an example... Everybody does. They go, okay, well, he was killing Christians, and so he's the worst. But that's not what's being said here. That's not the only thing being said here. See, in this world, we have scales of how we judge people's sin. And if I ask you, which one carries the worst punishment, right? It's probably murder. And you know why that is? Do you know why that carries a worse punishment? If you look at the Ten Commandments, murder makes the middle. They don't even make the top three. And you know why? It's because this world embraces life. Human life is the highest standard, right? That's the highest value. Not the image of God. I mean, when the image of God is degrading scale, 
It's easy to go, man, I'm the worst. It's easy to go, I'm the worst. When it starts out going, you better not put anything above me or anyone above me. That's what, that's what God starts out by saying. You better not worship anything else. Completely give yourself to anything else down here but me. And, and, and then murder comes in later, right next to like, hey, keep this one day holy. Like, don't desire what your neighbor has. All of those things require death. And so it's easy when you start to look at the greatest scales, the image of God and who he is and his glory and his name. It's easy to go, man, I'm the worst. And, and that's, that's, should be everybody in here. That should be how all of us, if you claim to follow Jesus, you should look at yourself. I'm the worst. And if you don't, you haven't, and you're not fully experiencing God's mercy. If you don't fully embrace being the worst of all sinners. Because if I asked you, like, who would you say is the worst in here, right? We'd have a, a whole bunch of different people give a bunch of different answers of who it is. And, and you know, I was used to think Pharaoh right away. So I'm like, man, that guy just face-to-face -face constantly with the power of God. And then every time he got a little bit of relief, went back to his sin, went back to his greed, went back to his control, went back to his power. Sound familiar? Yeah. Yeah. Get a little bit of relief. And we've all lived that life. And this is the problem with, with even people's testimonies. And this is why the church at large, when you're looking at a traditional church, is mostly dead because they don't look at their sin as the worst. They don't look at themselves as the worst sinners. And yet in Luke chapter 7, all Jesus was saying is, is hey, who, who would love me more, the one forgiven 50 or 500? And the guy who doesn't think he's the worst goes, well, you know, the one 500. Not realizing, man, the penalty is the same. What if you don't pay back the 50 and death is the consequence? What if you don't pay back the 500 and death is the consequence? And it should be based on the consequence. That's the creating scale. It's based on the consequence. Now what you've done is so there's people in, in the traditional church at large that they don't look at their sin as the worst. They don't look at themselves as the worst sinner. And even in this church, it's no different. I mean, you can find somebody... You can always find somebody that you'll be able to look at and go, nope, they're worse than me. I mean, I really started to, to think about this because this is what I spent my time doing with Jesus for the last couple days. And when I got alone with him, I was just worshiping him and crying tears of joy over the cross because I'm like, I'm the worst. I'm the worst. And yet you had mercy on me. And, and, and it, like, listen, I thought about it. I'm like, what about, like, Hitler? I mean, come on. Right? Right? But that's not the grading scale. I know Billy on, on Sunday was talking about going up the mountain and Moses going up the mountain. You weren't even allowed to touch the mountain or you were put to death. Without question. No ifs, ands, or buts. No oops, I slipped. He was like, man, if that filthiness touches my mountain, you understand like who he is? And that, man, he has made you, and then yet, how he has loved you? But if you don't think you're the worst of all sinners, it's like you're not experiencing the fullness of the mercy of God. Because you don't need the fullness. Other people need the fullness more than you. And so if you don't embrace being the worst of all sinners... You won't, you won't experience. That's why it says in, in James chapter 1, stare into the perfect law that sets you free. That's what it's talking about. It's a mirror to look in and go, and I don't mind how. And there's freedom there. But so often we drift into this spiritual arrogance. But it's all about his glory, and that's what it's talking about in verse 17. And so when's the last time that you were really 
just undone by the cross. Like really rejoicing because of the cross. I guarantee it traces back to you not thinking you're the worst. I guarantee it. You haven't had that moment hanging on the cross where you've had that realization of like, I deserve to die. I deserve to die. And yet, God's had mercy on me. And why? So that he could use me. That's what it says. I mean, I, I think if you ask anybody in here that at least claims to be a follower of Jesus, and you go, man, don't you want to be used by Jesus? You go, yeah. So if you're not embracing that you're the worst of all sinners, you're going to stifle being used by Jesus. You're going to get in the way of being used by Jesus. Because he said it himself. I didn't come to save anybody who thinks they're good. That's not who he uses. It's us being the worst that displays that he's the best. That's how that works. And as long as you try to hold on to your man or your woman card, right? Right? You're, you're, you're dulling the shine of Jesus' glory. And so it's that, so that you can be used by Jesus. And you'll miss out on being used by Jesus if you're not embracing that you're the worst of all sinners. But if you do, I'm telling you, it, it will set you free. You will experience true worship. Dare I say, again. Because that's where we're supposed to live. That's a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Everyone should embrace it. And how does he say that he, he will use us as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners? We were talking before we started. I heard these guys talking about the meeting, and you know nobody was talking, and so they just let it sit in silence. And I heard uh, Peter go, "Man, it was like ten minutes," and and Lodge was like, "No, it was only two. And, and listen, I started thinking because when we were at that place, right, I had to go down, and you know you make the waffle or whatever, and it's like you got to wait for the timer, and there's a line, and it goes two minutes, and and that's how long it goes, and it's a long time. And then, like, later we got to go to Subway. And this, I'm just telling you, I was not at Subway to buy a sandwich for Delilah. I was there as a representative of Jesus. And I walked in there, and the guy behind the counter, and it took about two minutes. Let me just tell you what can, what can be accomplished in two minutes. It took about two minutes. Delilah's ordering her sandwich. Guy's bringing me out. And he looks at me, and he goes, man, I, I love your tattoos. He goes, I love your tattoos. And he goes, I even like those ones on your knuckles, man. Those are sweet. And I realized in the moment that he didn't know what the tattoos meant. He just liked how they looked. And so I used two minutes to ask him, you know what this means? He goes, no, man, what's it mean? And you'll receive power from heaven when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be Jesus' witness. And then I proceeded to experience that power from heaven and share the gospel with this guy. And you know what I didn't do? Go, Jesus wants to save you and all that stuff and just start there. No, no, no. I said, listen. I was in a room surrounded by demons shooting up dope constantly. Smoking crack like they're like a never ending life of misery and torment. And I was like, and I cried out to God. And Jesus answered me and spoke and said, I never left and put me on my face and put a new spirit in me. And when I stood up, I for the first time in my life dumped drugs. And he changed my life. And I was like, and now he's using me to tell people that so they know too. Because that's what it says here. As a prime example of his great patience. So others will realize that they too can believe in him and, and receive eternal life. And, and you could just tell this guy was just in awe. And it would be no different with people that haven't lived a life like mine. 
if they really believed that they were the worst of all sinners? You know the impact that that would have even in the traditional church? If they really believed their sin was just as bad, if not worse, than everybody else's? And that's how they talked about it? And they openly talked about their thoughts that were hostile to Jesus and nasty to him and dirty to him and the things that they've done and how they deserve to die? Yeah, people in the church would be saved. That's what would happen. So I just told him, I'm the worst. And you could tell he realized in that moment like that he could he could be saved too. It's not like, oh, well, I guess I don't need Jesus. Everybody thinks it's going to go the opposite. But you take the Holy Spirit out of the equation when you do that. The Holy Spirit's actively working in that. Actively convicting. It doesn't go, oh, so I don't need Jesus. It goes, oh my gosh. If Jesus would save you, of course, I could believe too and have eternal life. The realization, the conviction of sin, that's what takes place. And so, like, I so bad tonight, I, I so bad, I just wanted to, I, I wanted to preach through, like, the one another's. And, and well, there's a whole bunch of stuff that I just sat in my office, I was like, man, I got, but it starts here. It starts here. It made sense when Jesus brought me here. Because like I, then I'm going to tell you what, like, oh, Jesus commanded us to love each other like he loved us. But if you don't think you're the worst of all sinners, you won't. If you, if you have an I know attitude, you won't really live out what Jesus is telling us to live out here. You won't really experience the fullness and the power of the word of God. And, and so I, I, you know, Here's one that it says we know. We talked about John 3.16. Here's 1 John 3.16. Easy to remember that way. We know. Here it is. We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. That, that word ought to, it doesn't mean like what we would think about. No, oh, I should. Probably should. It's optional. No, it means it's your duty to do that. That you must give up your lives to your brothers and sisters. And I think the most concerning thing to me is as I look around the church, it's easy to find people who would say that they would give up their lives. But it's not easy to see people actually doing it. And I'm not so stupid that I just believe that they would when the time came for whatever they think is going to happen when it's supposed to be how we live. We know what real love is. Oh, do you? Well, if you do, it'll show. And if not, if not, then there's a spiritual arrogance that you have that separates you from Jesus. It separates you from Jesus. He says that. Because if you know and it doesn't show, that's a problem. But all glory, all glory and all honor to Jesus, the one and only King, forever. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.